everybody, and welcome to That Wrestling Show, the podcast where all pro wrestling matters. I'm your host, Bill Yankovi, and this is a busy week on the show going to review WWE, well, not WWE, but NXT TakeOver in Your House, plus going to preview the Hell in a Cell pay-per-view, or what's left of the Hell in a Cell pay-per-view, I'll explain later on, plus... Going to be talking about WWE and the ESPY Awards. Yes, because when it comes to professional wrestling, nothing says professional wrestling quite like the WWE and the ESPYs. But, going to start off the show with good news as, well, two wrestlers both became fathers for the first time this week. John Moxley and Renee Young announced or had their baby girl on Tuesday, and uh, Renee Young or Renee Paquette uh, announced on Twitter that she had given birth to their first child. And I will read just a little bit of the tweet because the rest of it is, you know, her plugging her podcast. But she wrote on tweet on Tuesday. Baby girl is officially here, so I'm checking out and becoming a mom. She's absolutely incredible. Meanwhile, today, Cody Rhodes and Brandy welcomed their first child, a baby girl, as well. Uh, This was announced on Cody's Instagram account. Uh, There is a picture of Cody with... Brandy, his wife, and their newborn daughter's hand. And this is just a very brief thing. It says, 6 pounds, 12 ounces, Liberty Iris Runnels. Mother and daughter are doing wonderful. Uh, It is wonderful news to hear that both babies, uh, number one, were born. And both came out healthy, healthy. Only three days apart. That's going to be quite an interesting uh, scenario in about 20 to 25 years. If uh, both Liberty and uh, John Moxley's daughter decide to get into professional wrestling, that storyline will be. But happy, you know, congratulations to both families on the birth of their newborn baby. Major League Wrestling is in the news this week, and this is kind of a big deal because uh, after a year, yeah, only a year after they had signed a contract, Major League Wrestling is pulling out from the zone, which, of course, mainly hosts boxing fights. But um, they have opted out in lieu of working on a new contract. This is what was reported by Dave Meltzer in the newest Observer newsletter. Now, Major League Wrestling will continue to shop their streaming and library rights as they continue to slowly pull content off their YouTube page. It's unknown at this time how it affects their international contracts with The Zone as this deal was just for the U.S. market. In the original deal, uh, MLW Fusion was to be both part of the Zone's regular weekly schedule and on demand, in addition to future live shows, but because of the pandemic, the latter of which never materialized. To put more um, detail into this, basically, the Zone, and this is again from Meltzer, The Zone was decimated financially by spending so much on names like Canelo Alvarez and Gennady Golovkin that and some of their key players behind the scenes have left for WWE through Nick Khan. Their budgets got frozen once the Alvarez deal went south and it became a legal situation and the original ownership lost so much they didn't want to fund more losses. MLW will continue to air on BN Sports and Vice TV. 
Uh, this is kind of interesting news because the zone at that time, when the deal was made, this was kind of a big, you know, breakthrough because they had only done boxing and to a degree MMA. They had never done professional wrestling and Major League Wrestling was the one that went in on this and with the pandemic, a lot of stuff just did not work out and th basically they had no choice but to leave. Um, I had read a while back that maybe they're going to try to do something with Discovery Plus uh, their streaming service, which if they do that, I mean, you're only paying four ninety nine a month, so that's a steal in itself right there. So that'll be very interesting to see what happens because when you take a look at the, you know, at the game basically with streaming service, WWE obviously now with Peacock, uh, New Japan has their streaming service, Ring of Honor has theirs. Impact Wrestling has theirs, but you also have independentwrestling.tv, um, you have a bunch of other wrestling streaming services, uh, High Spots is another one. So Major League Wrestling right now, they're in a position where they could go to another streaming service, offer it, and, and I'm thinking, the from what I read, that... Discovery Plus might end up being the one they go with, but I'm not really sure. So uh, we'll definitely, you know, keep our eye on if any developments happen with Major League Wrestling as far as stream. Streaming service, but it will be very, very interesting to see where they do go. Okay, uh, this next story is kind of out of the funny end of professional wrestling, but um, <laughs> I'm going to be honest with you guys. Uh, I, I, I have heard of cryptocurrency, but I don't understand what the hell it is. I really don't. I mean, I, I think my sister and my nephews even tried to explain to my parents what it was and we didn't do any good um but mjf now has his own cryptocurrency i am not kidding he has his own cryptocurrency so he put out a tweet yesterday and i'm gonna read the tweet and then i'm gonna read uh these pictures here Describing what this is. So, MJF put out Doge, garbage. Bitcoin, garbage. Money MJF coin, better than you and you know it. So, uh, let's see what dollar MJF currency is. Just in case you've been living under a rock or are just plain stupid, cryptocurrency is the future. Well, I think I'm... Uh, is it the future though? Anyway. That's why I am doing you a favor by announcing the creation of Dollar MJF, a creator coin, also known as a social token, designed to create an economy around me, the fastest and youngest rising star in the history of professional wrestling. Why a creator coin? Creators and fans are finding new ways to engage, and as much as I'd rather avoid any interactions with you pores, I benefit from this as much as you do. By masterfully creating my own coin, I'm giving you a way to be part of my personal economy. I can't think of anything smarter to be a part of, since I will go down as the greatest star who's ever lived. By offering my own social token, I intend to recognize my top dollar MJF coin holders with special giveaways, drops, exclusive access, and more. Create a zero-fee, peer-to-peer method for people in the extended MJF community to interact and trade with one another. 
and enable dollar MJF coin holders the opportunity to receive rally rewards each Saturday. Is this a cryptocurrency? Yes! Duh, idiot! The dollar MJF coin is created on the rally sidechain. This makes it possible to swap dollar MJF coins and dollar RLY tokens, which are the rally network's default currency. The Rally Network is an open, decentralized network that has its own ERC-20 governance token, dollar $RLY, which means, it's a, which means it's an Ethereum blockchain-based asset that can be sent and received in the Ethereum mainnet network, and anyone holding dollar $RLY can vote on changes to the Rally Network. That's what's meant by governance. You can also convert dollar $RLY into dollar $ETH, which can then be swapped into standard fiat currency. There is no lock-in, though there may be gas fees charged. That's what keeps the Ethereum network running for each conversion. So, how do I get dollar MJF? Rally makes it easy to buy creator coins, even for the dumbest of the dumb, with a credit card, for those of you who don't previously own cryptocurrencies, which includes some fees from the third-party processor. Then, once you own some coins, you can send and exchange creator coins without any fees within the Rally network. If you're still confused as to what Rally is, I'm not shocked, look at Rally's most well-known creator until I showed up Portugal the man. Here's how to give me your money with a debit or credit card. Step 1. Create a rally account. Step 2. Visit the dollar MJF page. Step 3. Tap buy. Step 4. Choose debit or credit card. Step 5. Complete the transaction. Um, yeah, you know, this is a thing. <laughs> um... And this may be the first time I am showing my age here, but I have no idea what the hell this is. So I guess I'm going to say good luck to MJF with his cryptocurrency, I, I guess is the best way to put it. Oh, gosh. the, the be Oh, my God. Remember when t-shirts and other merchandise was the way to go? Remember that? It was so much easier back then. <laughs> Oh, my God. All right. So, earlier this week, uh, WWE.com announced that the WWE has its best WWE moment category returning to the ESPYs. And I'm sure you're wondering, what is the ESPYs? Well, the ESPYs are basically ESPN's awards, which honor quote-unquote, the best in sports. Now, two years ago, they had created this category for the best WWE moment, and the winner of that award was Roman Reigns for announcing that his leukemia was in remission. Now, this year, they are doing the voting a little bit differently. Because they're doing it in a tournament format. So, if you are interested in doing this, and for the pure entertainment of the show, I am going to do this for you guys. I am going to go through each of the first round pairings, and I will place my votes. Um... The voting in the first round ends June the 21st with the quarterfinals then taking place and the final four will be unveiled on June the 25th. The award ceremony for those that care is July the 10th at 8 p.m. So, with that said, here are the first round matches and I will tell you who I'm going to vote for. Match 1. Dominic Mysterio makes in-ring debut at SummerSlam with 
<clears throat> Dad, Rey Mysterio in his corner, or Roman Reigns returns to SmackDown and aligns with Paul Heyman. I'm going to give my vote to Roman Reigns. Match number two. Pat McAfee confronts and punts Adam Cole, or Goldberg returns to challenge Drew McIntyre for the WWE Championship. This is a no-brainer. Pat McAfee is getting my vote. <laughs> and then I have this ad for Capital One. All right, here we go. Match three. Now, this one is actually a tough one. Keith Lee breaks Adam Cole's record 403-day reign as NXT champion at the Great American Bash, or Sasha Banks and Bianca Belair become the first black women to battle in a WrestleMania main event. Who? Both are good moments. Um, I'm going to go with Sasha and Bianca on that one. Okay, the next set. Edge wins the 2021 Men's Royal Rumble and becomes the third person ever to win from the number one spot. Or Kevin Owens stuns Logan Paul at WrestleMania. I am going with Edge. As much as I love KO, I really don't give a crap about Logan Paul. Match 5. Sasha Banks wins the SmackDown Women's Championship at Hell in a Cell. Or, Randy Orton sets the Fiend on fire. Oh, man. You know, some of these choices are not that good. Um, I'm going to go with Sasha Banks winning the SmackDown title. It's just the safer choice. Uh, here's the sixth match. Undertaker celebrates his 30th anniversary and gives his final farewell. Or Bobby Lashley wins the WWE Championship for the first time. It should be Lashley winning the WWE title, but people are going to vote for The Undertaker. But I am going to vote for the almighty Bobby Lashley in this one. So we have two more here. Match 7, Bailey turns on Sasha Banks. Or Bad Bunny teams with Damian Priest at WrestleMania and unveils a Bunny Destroyer. Um, you know what? I'm going to go with Bad Bunny. That was, <laughs> I really liked Bad Bunny's performance. And the final match of first round in this voting, Bianca Belair wins the Women's Royal Rumble, sets a record for longest time spent in the match. Or The Miz cashes in money in the bank at Elimination Chamber, becoming the first two-time Grand Slam champion. I am going with Bianca Belair. That was an incredible performance. So, again, if you care to vote, uh, go to ESPN.com. Uh, the ESPYs are up. And you could vote on so many other <clears throat> wonderful categories. But the quarterfinals uh, will begin on June 21st, which is this coming Monday. And the final four will be unveiled next Friday. And then from there, maybe, maybe I will figure out what I will vote for as the best WWE moment of the year. Okay, now with that said, let's talk about NXT TakeOver In Your House, which was this past Sunday night. And this was interesting for a number of reasons, one of which is that the show started at 8 p.m. I, I didn't realize that until I got ready at 6.30 thinking, oh, okay, the show's going to be at 6, you know, the show's going to start at 7 and... You know, should be an easy night, and then it's like, nope, show starts at 8 o'clock. So, um, I did not see the pre-show match, um, which was Zoe Stark and Sari beating Jesse Kamea and Aaliyah. I, like I said, I did not see that match. I didn't even know they had a pre-show match or a kickoff match, so I'm not going to you know, penalize 
anybody there. All right, so let's get to the show. Five matches in total, and we began with a six-man tag team match where both the NXT North American and tag team titles were on the line. The champions, Bronson Reed and MSK, facing Legado del Fantasma of Santos Escobar, Raul Mendoza, and Joaquin Wilde. This was a fun, enjoyable match right from the get-go. Um, you had some good early wrestling. You had the tease of Escobar wanting Bronson Reed but tagging out. You had a lot of good three-on-one spots from both tag teams. I really enjoyed you know, both sides watching this match. Um... Saw a lot of high flying, you know, high spot moves. Even even Bronson Reed did a dive through the ropes, and I think they said he's like three twenty or three thirty. And if I may borrow a gorilla monsoonism, this guy is not that. He's probably closer to the four hundred pound mark, but you know, maybe I'm wrong. Uh Legado del Fantasma. Eventually does take control over and they work on uh, Wesley during the match. But Carter comes in, then Bronson Reed. And then I love the ending to this match. I loved the end of this match because Escobar goes to the outside. And he grabs the North American title. So he's looking at the title. And he just has this look on his face. There's a camera right th- there's a camera right there. And it's like he has this mad laugh, mad yell. And then here comes Bronson Reed and he just boom right through the barricade, knocking Escobar out, which was a really good spot. And then Carter and Lee hit a two-on-one move and then Bronson Reed hit the top rope splash to get the three count as Reed, Carter, and Lee retained the their respective titles. A really good, solid opening match. I'm actually going to change my grade a little bit. I had this initially as a B-, minus, but I'm going to change it to a B. It was a rather enjoyable, fun Six-man tag match to start the pay-per-view. Then we go to Mercedes Martinez against Zia Lee. And this was actually kind of an enjoyable match. Oh, oh, actually, I forgot to mention Meltzer's rating. He gave that six-man tag four stars. So, Mercedes Martinez and Zia Lee. This was an this was actually an enjoyable match. It was a fun match to watch. It didn't go long. Xia Lee wins with a beautiful roundhouse kick. I mean, it was beautiful looking. And you could see, you know, some improvement in Xia Lee in over the last few years. And I don't watch NXT as much. As I used to. But from what I saw. You know. To where she was at a few years ago. She's definitely getting better. I mean. Maybe she's got a little ways to go. But she is getting better. So Zia Lee with a beautiful roundhouse kick. Gets the three count in the victory. So after the match. Zia Lee gets a chair from Boa. Well Mercedes is quick enough. But. She comes back, she beats up Xia Lee and beats up Boa. Then the leader of the group, whose name is Mia Ying or Mai Mei Ying, I guess is the right way to pronounce it. Like I never knew her name until this night. So she gets up and Martinez has to stare down. And Ying kind of puts on the Tongan death grip. the You know, like the move that Haku Ming used to do. But Mercedes fought back. And 
Ying grabs her again and then throws her off the platform, which is really like a two-foot drop. But that storyline I don't think is through. I gave this match a C. It, like I said, it, it wasn't offensive. It was an enjoyable match. It, it really was. Uh, Melter gave this two and a quarter stars. Then we go to the ladder match for the million dollar belt with LA Knight facing Cameron Grimes. I really enjoyed this match. This was a fun match and I really became more of a Cameron Grimes fan after this match. These guys didn't go right away for the ladder, which I thought was a smart idea. Um, eventually they would, but man, some of the bumps these guys were taking were absolutely insane. And there's even one spot where Grimes climbs up the, the, the scaffold and does kind of like a stage dive onto L.A. Knight, which got a really big pop and at one point Grimes is alone in the ring he's got like he he could win the million dollar bill but then he stops and he's yelling I'm going for the gold and there's this big gold ladder with dollar signs uh, you know, right at the front of the entrance. So he grabs that, brings that in, tries to get the belt. Uh, LA Knight is able to come back. They fight for a little bit. Then the end, Grimes has his hand on this briefcase of the million dollar belt and he's touching it. But LA Knight comes up is able to fight and then pushes off Grimes and Grimes goes flying onto the ladder back first and it takes him out of the match and LA Knight is able to grab the briefcase and the million dollar belt and LA Knight wins the match a really fun match I, I really enjoyed this match I gave this a B Meltzer gave it three and three quarter stars then we go to the NXT women's title match. Ember Moon challenging Raquel Gonzalez. And I don't know about this match. This match, uh, maybe there was something about this match. Maybe it went a little too fast. I I'm not really sure. Um, Ember Moon on a few occasions tried to win and Dakota Kai would somehow get involved either putting Gonzalez's foot on the rope or doing some other tactic and it was enough to the point where Shotzi Blackheart came out and chased Dakota Kai off and it ended up being one-on-one -on -one, and Gonzalez ended up doing the one hand power bomb with Amber Moon to get the three count and retain the title. Um I mean I like Raquel Gonzalez. I think she is getting better. This this match just didn't really quite work with me. Not the worst match of the night. I, I did not think this was the worst match of the night. I gave this a C. Meltzer gave it three stars. And then to the main event. Uh, the NXT title on the line in a fatal five-way. Kyle O'Reilly, Adam Cole, Johnny Gargano, and Pete Dunne challenging the champion Karrion Cross. So, in my mind, I'm thinking, okay, they've said that this is the biggest attended event, you know, at the Capitol Wrestling Center, which is 300 people. So, I'm, I'm sitting there. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, if they're going to do, you know, the the whole entrance of Karrion Cross with the fall, you know, fall and pray, fall and pray thing, this would have been the night to do it, or at least I think this would be the night to do it. Silence. It 
was dead silent. And and I'm gonna I'm gonna give my thought after this match with Karrion Cross. The match is such a mixed bag for me because there are some parts where it is good and there are other parts where for me it just misses like it, it just didn't really work out or at least I didn't think it did so early on the four challengers are trying to take Karrion Cross out they go to the entrance way they shove Karrion Cross through the you know the house door to try to get him out of the picture which was a good idea and then the four would fight but Cross would come back and then Cross would dominate for a little bit. And then we get a spot where O'Reilly and Cole, you know, they're looking at each other. Cross is kind of hanging on to the top rope. And they just decide, screw this, we're just going to take him out. They power bomb him on the table, but the table doesn't break. So then it becomes the four of them again for the rest of the match. And then... Cross gets back up and it looks like he kind of no sold, you know, no sold the power bomb even though he'd been out for a few minutes. And you know, everyone is giving them their best shot and he kind of goes down but just doesn't and then we get to the end. It's a series of nice moves from Gargano and Cole and Dunn and O'Reilly. And then O'Reilly, at the end, he's got, you know, a, a heel hook on Adam Cole. And it's like, okay, this could do it. Well, here comes Cross back into the ring, because he had been out, and he puts kind of like a rear naked choke on to O'Reilly. O'Reilly is holding on to the heel hook. He's not letting go, and... You know, Cross is kind of putting on the pressure of this choke, and O'Reilly finally lets go, and the referee checks on O'Reilly. O'Reilly has passed out. Karrion Cross retains the NXT title. I wanted to get into this match. I I really did. It just, there was something about this match that just did not work for me. So I gave the match a C. Melter gave it four and a quarter stars. I think that that may be a little too much of a rating there. But I want to go back real quick to talk about Karen Cross. And what I, there's, as a fan, I'm, I'm saying this as a fan. I think there's a couple of issues. One of which is not his fault. It's the timing of everything. Because last year they had built up, you know, the whole like TikTok thing. And it's like, okay, there's someone coming. Well, this is a good idea. And yeah, we had just started the pandemic but you know at the time it's like well maybe this pandemic will go and you know we'll be back to normal life but it didn't happen so the timing is not carrying cross's fault it is not his fault at all it's just he had bad they they nxt had bad timing as far as when this guy came and another thing is the entrance. Like, I've seen this entrance. You know, like Scarlet comes down, lip syncs the song, and, you know, basically the whole entrance is to try to get this reaction and to have you chant, you know, fall and pray, fall and pray. That's the entire thing. And as it showed on Sunday, there was no reaction. And that is a big, big problem. Because if you look 
Okay, I'll use New Japan, for example. Minoru Suzuki's entrance. When he comes out, there are people that sing the chorus. You know, once he gets to the ring and he gets in the ring. People sing the chorus. Or, when, or to go even further back, when Goldberg would come out, the Goldberg chants would start. You know, it's just, they, there is something missing in this connection of the entrance to the fans. There's something missing, and I'm not really sure what it is. And I think the final thing that kind of gets me with Karrion Cross is I just can't buy into the character. I really cannot buy into the character. I mean, the guy's got a tremendous look. He's over 200 pounds. He's got muscles. He's got, you know, the beautiful woman by his side. But what's the gimmick? What is the gimmick of Karrion Cross? Is it like he's this, you know, mercenary angel of death type person or... What what's the gimmick? I don't know the gimmick. I don't understand the gimmick. I mean, is he like a, a hired assassin? I I really don't know. I I I just can't figure it out. Um, because I'll tell you what, when WWE gets back on the road, and eventually Cross is going to make it to the main roster. There's no doubt. He and Scarlett are going to be on the main roster. They're going to have to figure this out. Otherwise, this whole package is in trouble. And if you can't get the fans... If you couldn't get an audience of roughly 300 people to do the chant that you're supposed to be doing, you're in trouble. And it's not a good look. All right, so as far as the show goes, it kind of felt like an average show, to be honest. I, I, I would give it a C. My favorite match, I, I really like the ladder match. I really do. Uh, but the six-man was really good as well. But I'm, I'm going to give it to the... Uh, I'm going to give it a ladder match, but just by a hair. Just by, like, the smallest of margins. So... Um... One last piece of news. Uh, Don West announced earlier this week that he is suffering from brain lymphoma and is starting treatment immediately. Don West is 57 years old and he kind of, in a way, had two lives. The first life being him on the home shopping network and his other life was on TNA Wrestling, where he was the color man with Mike Tanay for so many years. And, um, look, I we, we've all made fun of him. But it's in good nature. You know, I never hated the guy. It's just the way, you know, he was announcing, it was like, Ah, oh, look at that move! Look at the way he jumped! It was incredible! It was amazing! You know, that's what made it fun. I kind of like Don West the person. Don West the person seems like a really cool guy. Um, is he the greatest wrestling announcer of all time? No. I, I think even he would say he's not the greatest announcer of all time. But he was fun and he actually brought something different, you know, to, to wrestling. And that's what made him cool and kind of fun to listen to. Um, of course, he has since left wrestling. He's doing other stuff. Uh, but he did announce earlier this week that he does have uh, brain lymphoma. Uh, 57 years old. That That's too young for something like that. I um, want to send my you know support and well wishes to Don, his wife Terry, and the entire family. And uh, hopefully, you know... Don will beat this, and we'll we'll have more Don West. Maybe Don West can make a comeback in a few years, and we could have more Don West fun with him because 
like I said, you know, not the greatest announcer, but he was kind of a fun guy to listen to and a hell of a guy to impersonate. Hell of a guy. Well, now we're going to Hell in a Cell, and it is this Sunday. Now, remember, it's an 8 p.m. start, not 7, like I thought it was within your house, so got to remember that. Originally, there were five matches on this card. Now there is only four. Why is there four? Well, because one of the bigger matches, Roman Reigns defending the Universal title against Rey Mysterio, is now happening on SmackDown tonight. Really? Really? So, I'm going to do the best that I can with four freaking matches. Oh my god. Why? Un un unless tonight on SmackDown, they barf out like three additional matches. This might not be a show you'd want to watch. So, here we go. The card, in quotes, of this Sunday's Hell in a Cell. Alexa Bliss against Shayna Baszler. Uh, Alexa Bliss is winning that. There's just no need to even... She, she's just going to win. Bianca Belair defending the SmackDown Women's title against Bayley. I kind of thought a couple weeks ago going, you know, before this, I thought this would have been one of the Hell in a Cell matches, but it's actually not, which, again, kind of surprises me. Uh, I'm, I'm gonna say Bianca holds the title. I, 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 like, I just can't see her losing it. I really can't. But this next one, I could see the title changing hands. Rhea Ripley against Charlotte Flair for the Raw Women's title. Again, going to go with an old line here. You never bet against Charlotte Flair. I do think Charlotte is going to win the Raw Women's title. I, I just think it will happen. And finally, the WWE Championship on the line inside Hell in a Cell. Bobby Lashley defending against Drew McIntyre. The stipulation to the match, if Bobby Lashley wins, Drew McIntyre cannot receive another shot at the WWE title until Drew or Bobby is no longer champion. So if Drew loses, that's it. It's the end of the line for him. And I see Bobby lose, or no, not losing. I see Bobby retaining the WWE title. Uh... Bobby's been a very good champion. I can't see him dropping the title. Uh, I don't know wh where they're going to go with Drew after this, but uh should be very, very interesting to see what happens. Like I said, hopefully, and that is the key word, hopefully they will add a few more matches to this show even though we've now lost Roman Reigns and... Why, why the hell would you do that? Seriously. Why the hell would you do that? Okay, uh, before I wrap it up, uh, I do want to announce that I am doing a brand new podcast. Uh, it is the DK and Bill Wrestling Podcast. It's going to be a video podcast where myself and my good friend DK from Canada, we're going to get together and we're going to talk about wrestling. Uh, this first episode, which should be out tomorrow on Saturday, is going to be two topics, actually. We're going to talk about Chris Benoit and we're going to talk about 1997 professional wrestling and I could tell you I'm really looking forward to doing the show with DK I am more of a co-host here in this situation but I will get to talk and I will get to have 
my opinion on a few things here and there. But check it out, the DK and Bill Wrestling Podcast. It is a video podcast. The link is in the Facebook group for that wrestling show right now. You guys can check it out. Come and join, and you can watch our debut episode this weekend. So that will do it, but before I leave, get into the plugs. If you guys have any questions or comments, send an email, wrestlingman at thatwrestlingshow.com. Don't forget to follow the show on Twitter at WrestlingShow11. Follow the show on Instagram, That Wrestling Show. Join the Facebook group, That Wrestling Show Fan Group. And if you like what you heard here and you want more content, check out the Patreon page, patreon.com backslash that wrestling show where our highest tier is three dollars that's right three dollars is our highest tier so check it out on patreon now to plug uh friends of the show and other podcasts check out our vantage point the retro wrestling podcast with joe Morata and michael quinn this week in change your mind Kona Crush is the best version of Crush. Well, we'll try to change your mind. Plus, week four of the Royal Rankings of the Best World Title Changes and a review of Shotgun Wrestling from January 7th, or January 4th, pardon me, 1997. That is this week on our Vantage Point. Also, check out Greetings from Allentown with Peter Winson where he watches one episode of professional wrestling each week in his own unique perspective. This week, he reviews an episode of All American Wrestling from February 12, 1984. That is this week on Greetings from Allentown. Also, check out Juice Pro Wrestling, where this week it's kind of a short show, kind of like last week's episode of that wrestling show. Uh, it's a sick day, and it's just threatening talking about his favorite wrestlers but check him out anyway juice pro wrestling now if you're looking for non-wrestling related podcasts check out the best pick movie pod with tom john and jess three people who love the movies and they have watched each and every academy award-winning best picture winner in no particular order and they are very close to the end this week they are joined by Tom Tuck as they watch and discuss the best picture winner of 2001, A Beautiful Mind, that is this week on the Best Pick Movie Podcast. Also, check out The Castle Vault, which is a chronological deep dive of Disney animated films powered by Disney+. Plus. This week they discuss the 2020 animated movie Onward, that is this week on the Castle Vault. Also check out Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al podcast, where this week they interview magician Justin Willman, who is the star and creator of Netflix Magic for Humans and the original host of Cupcake Wars. He discusses his upcoming charity event, Magic for Memories, which features Weird Al, plus a lot more that is this week on Dave and Ethan's 2,000-inch Weird Al podcast. Also, check out Bill Learns Kingdom Hearts, the podcast where myself and Jim Boy Star we discuss what happens in the Kingdom Hearts game. I watch a video, 30 minutes each, and talk about what happens. And guess what? We have made it to the end of season one. This is the season one finale this week where I will get my test results. Did I do better than Brett from Young Medicine? Well, you'll have to tune in to find out on the season finale of Bill Learns Kingdom Hearts. And, of course, Shark's Pond, a South Park podcast where I watch and review and discuss each and every South Park episode. This week, I discuss the season 12 episode, Overlogging, that is this week on Shark's Pond, a South Park podcast. Next week on the show, I am going to be reviewing the Hell in a Cell pay-per-view. And also next week, I wanted to have kind of a an interesting debate. 
Which promotion does have the best women's division in professional wrestling? Because, you know, you heard Triple H talk about how NXT has it, you know, Raw, SmackDown. Well, I kind of want to put that debate to rest because next week I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to have a couple people with me to discuss what is, where is the best women's division in all of professional wrestling. Where is it? Is it NXT? Is it Raw? I doubt it. Is it SmackDown? Probably not. Maybe AEW, maybe Impact. Who knows? But we're going to have that discussion next week here on That Wrestling Show. Everybody have a good, safe weekend. Have a wonderful Father's Day weekend to all you dads out there. And when you're done cooking up on the grill and, you know, having a burger and a dog, come back here next week for another episode of That Wrestling Show, the podcast where all pro wrestling matters. And as always, wrestle on.